Every single day that we wake up, God is saying, you still have not fulfilled your purpose. Yeah. There's still more work for you here to yeah. do. I remember when at the fellowship, we were trying to assess the best way to distribute aid. We give around $80 million of food aid a year. And we work very hard in order to make sure every penny goes directly to the people. Yeah. And there was someone in the office who came and said, we should close down the soup kitchens. They're not, they're not what we want to do is give dignity. Soup kitchens are not dignified. We shouldn't be supporting it. I remember I went to the soup kitchen and I saw people in Israel from Russia sitting together and speaking Russian. Yes. And Ethiopians unity. sitting together unity and table. speaking Amhari. And I remember I went back to the office and I said, we're funding more soup kitchens. Absolutely. So I think something that ties all of us together is that we have this passion and calling to serve. And in a way, everyone has a calling to serve. I remember when I had my little babies and I was the only working mom. All my friends were home with their babies and they'd say, oh, it must be so hard that you're out working and you know, we're home with our babies. It's so much easier. We get to drink coffee. And I would look at them and say, this is your calling right now. Right. It's no less than my calling. Just like my calling is no less than your calling. We're all called to serve in different ways in right. different parts of our lives. And I think... For me, what's been such a challenge is to serve in those places that I know God wants me to be, even when it's personally challenging oh, for yeah. me. Mm -hmm. And so I look in the Bible for all these different role models of how do you serve when it's hard for you? And there are so many different ways for me that I've experienced kind of that hardship of serving. It could be from a physical perspective of when I go to bring food boxes in Ukraine to elderly Holocaust survivors and I walk in the house and there is a smell that makes you literally want yeah. to throw up. Yeah. The smell of poverty, of a home that hasn't been cleaned, of no air, condi no air conditioning in the summer, no heating in the winter, of, of just a neglected person mm -hmm. who has had no one to care for them or love them, who needs a full-time home care worker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you walk in and the smell is horrible and they haven't left their bed and they're, I don't need to go into details, but it's hard to get close to them. Yeah. Not because you're disgusted by them, but because yeah. it's hard. So when I enter those situations, sometimes it's that, and sometimes it's leaving my children in order to go out and serve others mm -hmm. and having my baby, my, my Sapir, my 11 year old, she's almost 12, who every time when I leave, even for one night, she cries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I always try to include her in the ministry and say, you know, you're cared for. You're, I have to go to other children who aren't cared for. I have to go to orphans and bring them clothing. You have a whole closet of clothing. They don't have clothes. They're waiting for me to come and get her part of this ministry. But, but the mission of serving is both rewarding and challenging. And throughout both of those challenges, the personal family challenges and the physical challenges of working all night, going into and helping someone who is hard to help them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people are angry. Sometimes people aren't kind. Mm -hmm. For me, I've tapped into this remedy of just putting it into God's hand mm -hmm. and, and asking myself, yeah, Elle, are you really called to do this? And if the answer is yes, putting everything else on the side and only seeing God's image in front of me of whatever I'm doing. And I get my strength so much from Queen Esther. Yeah, I love her. That's why I called you Esther earlier. <laughs> Esther, yes. <laughs> that I realized that God doesn't need me mm -hmm. and God is relying on me. Yeah. He's called me. I need to step up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, if I don't, he'll find someone else to yeah. do it. Yeah. yeah. And so but we miss out. But we miss out. Yeah. I always ask the question, why did God create the world? Why did he need us? And there's a teaching that says that God, before he created the world, was perfect. He was all-encompassing, except for one thing. He didn't have anyone to give his love to. And so he created the world so he can give love, so he can give of himself. And we're all created in God's image. God gave a spark of himself when he created each of us, when he breathed the breath of life into our souls, through our nostrils. He gave a piece of himself. And that is our responsibility to give. That is our ability to live a godly life. What does that look like? Giving in the image of God. 
completing that part of God that he himself couldn't couldn't do. He couldn't give. He created us so he could give us life. Why did he give us life? So that we can continue giving. That it's a responsibility in this world. God calls us to spread light. He created the world with darkness and with light and called us to choose light with life and death and called us to choose life. He doesn't hate many things, but it says, though, Avea Hashem Sinura, lovers of the Lord despise evil. How do we despise evil? Simply by filling the space with good. When you fill a space with good, there's no evil that can penetrate, and one tiny little flame can light up an entire dark room. So every tiny good deed that we do, that we give, when we give love, we are lighting up. We are a candle that's lighting up an entire dark room. So I'm wondering from, from you wise women, um, could you relate to this idea of the challenges of serving? And what are the tools that you use? I think a lot of people watching have different challenges, whether it's in their marriage of how do you serve your partner mm -hmm. in the sense of having grace mm -hmm. during the hard times mm -hmm. or how do you serve your children when you just don't feel like it yeah. or how do you go to work when you don't feel like you're being paid enough or you're in a bad environment i think every part of our lives revolves around serving to a certain extent yeah, yeah. this idea of serving is very prominent mm -hmm. for people of faith but i think what's less spoken about is where do you get the tools from to serve even when you don't feel like it? Mm -hmm. I remember my little grandma was married. Um, her She was married to my grandfather for 60 some years and then he passed away and she remarried. <laughs> and he uh, got difficult just from his age to, to take care of. Yeah. And she just said one day, she said, you know, she said, I just do it all as unto the Lord. There you go. And she was just so cute about it. She <laughs> says, every time I do something, she said, I just yeah. I just do it as unto the Lord. And that's what we were told to do in the Bible. Yeah. Just do it, everything that you do, do it as unto the Lord. And I know there are so many people, there's people by themselves, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, that are left alone that we we hear from so often. We we know what it's like to take care of your parents. You know, well, I'm in kind of in that yeah. season of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Making sure my little mama's okay, you know, and yeah. and what do you do now, you know, and what you know, so all those questions, and so all the things of life, then little children, and then it just yeah. goes on and on for all the different people. But I think when we get in those hard spots, and it's like, oh God, I know you have the strength for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. God, give me the strength. Yeah. yeah, we have not because we ask not. Yeah. When we need God, we just need to tell Him. Wow. Because he knows it. We just need to say, God, I need your help. I need your strength right now. And everything that I do today, I'm going to do it as like I'm doing it to you. I know that people know say that, right? Simple. But no, it's it's huge, Lori. Yeah. If you do everything as unto the Lord, because sometimes the people you're serving are not that grateful. If you're doing it as unto the Lord, <laughs> right. that's a totally different thing because it's like, this is the right thing to do, whether you guys get it, whether you're yeah, grateful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the things that was really interesting for me, when Christian was in high school, they had this thing in his high school here in Dallas where for four years you could join this Young Men's Service League. Mm -hmm. And it's a thing for boys and their mothers. And so we joined together. So for four years, and you do all sorts of different projects and basically you're volunteering. Mm -hmm. And we did all sorts of things. It's like a Habitat for Humanity where you help build homes and do all sorts. But then the, the one thing that we had on the second year was um, the food pantry, you know, that we would go and a couple nights a week, we would help restock the food pantry and then serve when the doors were opened. And it was maybe only open for a couple of hours. And then we got in the car and drove home and Christian was really, really quiet. And I said to him, are you okay, babe? And he said, yeah. He, she said, mom, that could be us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think what hadn't yeah. occurred to him mm -hmm. was that all around us, because yeah. not everybody who showed up at the food pantry looked like they were homeless. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them looked like they just were in a place where they had need mm -hmm. and they needed some help, whether for a mm -hmm. short amount of time or for a long amount of time. Right. And his thing was, it really shook him and I think shaped him for the rest of his life to realize mm -hmm. We need to have our eyes open because people around us are hurting. Yeah. And 
And serving is one of the, the greatest gifts that we're given, this privilege of being able to serve. Yeah. So I, I, I love watching him now because now he's studying to be a clinical psychologist. I think he's trying to understand his parents. <laughs> Good luck with that. Help his mother. <laughs> Help his mother, yeah. But I see that same heart of compassion of, because I think it's so easy for us as, as humans to just see what we see on the surface of a person right. and, but, and not see what's underneath. Yeah. Not see the heart that's broken. Yeah. Not see the mind that's confused. Not see all the different things. Mm -hmm. And I know that's something you see every day. Um, with mm -hmm. the people you serve. I know as a pastor, yeah. that's something you see yeah. Yeah. every day. We all do. Right. That I have made a daily prayer. God, give me eyes to see what I would miss Amen. today. Yeah. And give me ears to hear behind what somebody's saying yeah. to what's actually going on. Yeah. We never know. No, we don't know. Yeah. I remember a woman coming up to me and she was furious with me. She'd listened to me speak for th three sessions at a conference and, you know, <laughs> Apparently You're she was pretty good. <laughs> she was not thrilled. But she said, I'm so sick of hearing about your perfect family. And I'm like, oh gosh, my family is not perfect. And she said, okay, then your perfect son. And I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, pay attention. Yeah. So I said to her, do you, do you have time just to go for a, a bit of a walk? And we walked out of the church and, to, and I said to her, we stopped and I said to her, what happened to you? That's yeah. good. She and honestly, at first I thought she was going to deck me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But she fell into my arm. Oh. She has buried two boys. Oh my gosh. And it was just, uh -huh. we live in a world of hurting people. Yeah. And sometimes the easiest thing to access is anger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But right behind it is brokenness. Yes. And when we can learn to serve and to have compassion and to see beyond what we see. And I believe that. I mean, it's, you talked about that, Laurie, that if anybody acts, lacks wisdom, ask the Lord. I mean, yeah. he'll tell us. Mm -hmm. If it's like, Lord, I don't get what's going on here. He'll tell us. How can we be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit's prompting in serving others? The greatest answer that I found for this is to be more aware and to start with the question every day, God, how can I serve others? How can I give today? And once we ask that question, we then see an opportunity that unfolds before us all around us to serve others because there aren't a lot of people that go through every day saying, God, how can I give? Most of us live our lives without really asking that question. So the sensitivity begins by asking the right question. I think a great question is how do you know you're called to serve? Yes. And how do you know what you're called to serve in? You know, I think does it change? Right. Mm -hmm. And does that definition change or how do you adapt to it as it does? Don't you think it's where you feel in those places where you're and you feel this is why I was put on this planet? Yes. Because, you know, there's things I've been asked to Sweet do. Spot. Yeah. That I'm thinking, well, I'll, I'll do it because you asked me, but this is definitely not my calling. Right. But there's other things where the minute you're doing it, you think, oh, clicks. Mm -hmm. this is what I was yeah. put on this earth for. Yep. There's yeah. a certain, it's like a, this alignment with, yeah with who God's made you to be. And it doesn't mean it's easy. No. Oh gosh, no, but it that, usually but means it, means, it doesn't. You're right, but when there's a grace, I right. think yeah. that's what, when you really feel the grace of God on mm -hmm. something, you know, okay, he's grace is unmerited favor. So he is favoring me to be able to accomplish something I could not do on my own. Yeah. I remember getting sick, I mean, to the point of like vomiting whenever I'd have to speak. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was years like that. I would get very sick. And I remember Priscilla, um, she told a story that really helped me one day at lunch. She said she worked for Zig Ziglar when she first started, and she said, I had the same thing, Amy. I, I would get sick every time, and I kept calling in sick and not going to these corporate events. And, and he called me to check on me, Zig Ziglar, and he said to me, could it be, Priscilla, that the enemy has attached fear to the very thing you're called to do? Wow. Good so, sign. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yeah, because if you can do it in your own power yeah. and you don't need yeah. grace, mm -hmm. but I think it takes discernment for people to know, yeah. am I am I forcing a door open that isn't there? Right. Yeah. Or, you know, is it just a struggle in my flesh and maybe a lack of desire? I don't have to want to do it to do it well. Right. You know, I remember one of our friends used to teach on the difference between um, Leah and Rachel is that the one he was really in love with, Jacob was in love with Rachel, but she wasn't the producer. It was having children with her was a constant struggle. But, but Leah, the one that wasn't attractive to him, 
was the one that produced and produced and produced and produced. And I think that can happen for us as well with our calling. Is it, it, maybe you wanted to be home and drink coffee, right. you know, but for you, it was like, I, I have a burning though desire and I can't stop thinking about this thing. One of the things that was important to me when I was just a little girl growing up in Scotland was to find ways, because I remember at church or in Sunday school or wherever I went to at church, one of the things that was really clear to me was that all the people who loved Jesus, and after he was gone, their main thing was, well, how can we help other people? How can we serve other people? So I began thinking, well, that's obviously what you're supposed to do. If you follow Jesus, you're supposed to help other people. And so when I was young, it started in really little ways. I would knock on the neighbor's house and say, is there anything you need? Do you need your dishes washed? You know, do you need anything done? And as I grew and got married, it, it developed into different ways, but always having this heart of seeing we're here to serve. It's not uh, something we have to do, it's, it's a privilege. And then when I became a mom, to teach my son that one of the greatest joys in life, and I love that I see this in him every day, is to look for ways to serve other people. And it doesn't have to be big and showy, it can be paying for the person who's behind you in line for their coffee, or just knocking on the door of someone you know who's elderly and saying, hey, have you had a hot meal recently? There's so many ways we can serve one another. How do you know what you're called to do to serve? And I think by definition is if there's a grace. And also serving isn't a job description. I think it's also when you see that need, we, when you see a need, yeah. mm -hmm. and you know that God has a sign for you to be a part of the answer to that need. Yeah. Yeah. And it's something that feels natural to do. It's not a, I mean, and not that we don't serve in other ways, like you said, there are things that we do because yeah. we're obedient and we do it. But there's something about, like I said earlier, that sweet spot yeah. where you see you're like, oh, I could do that. Or I enjoy that. Yeah. Or I don't know how, but I do that and it just feels like I'm breathing, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, one of the things I love, um, I love singing, I love speaking, I love doing all of that. But one of my favorite things that I've loved for years is after the event is over, standing out there, mm -hmm. talking and loving on people. I'm like, if they'll stay for three hours, I'll stay three hours and 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's like, I love it. And when we did Women of Faith together, I would bring all these kids with me, these preteens and teenagers. And one of the things that I did my best to instill in them was that it's not just what you do on stage that matters, right. it's what you do off the stage. Yeah. So when we're walking the halls, you say hello to everybody. When you're in an elevator, hello. In the bathroom and the janitor's cleaning the floors, hello. Like you speak with them. You don't just speak to the people that you think are gonna get you somewhere. Yeah. This is These are the people we're called to serve. Mm -hmm. If you see someone who seems like they have a challenge, then we stop the line for them. They become like the biggest person in the room. Their moment. It's yeah. their moment, you know? And so, um, I've seen a lot of those same kids over the past decade. Now, a lot of them are lead singers of their own bands. They're traveling all over. And the thing that makes me the most proud of them is not everybody applauding or with their songs on the radio or when I'm walking through Walmart, I hear them. But it's seeing them after the concert, yeah. serving the people yeah. in the way that God has designed for them to serve them seeing them, loving on them, praying for them, encouraging them, listening to them, you know? And it may not be anything super huge, but for that person it might be, yeah, you know? Absolutely. And it's another avenue of service, you know? And so I think sometimes the big things just earns us the right to be able to speak into someone else's life with a little more validity. You know, I love the fact that He allows us to participate in His command, not suggestion, but His command to love one another. Um, I think when we are, when we, we love each other, it's kind of one of those things, it's one of those gifts that keeps on giving, and it's a gift that's reciprocal. You know, when we plant love in other people, then God allows like a harvest of love to be returned back to us in other ways. And it may not be from the same person that you love on. The person that you're choosing to serve and that you're choosing to sacrifice on behalf of, you know, may not be the one that gives you all the love that you feel like you need to have. But I promise you, if you're loving on behalf of Christ and you're you're doing it out of obedience to Him, then He will make sure that you are um, filled with His love and other people who will love on you and the returns that will come back to you will be 
in keeping with the love of Christ. And so um, I'm so thrilled that he allows me to be a part of his family, that he allows me to give love. Um, he allows me to receive the love that he has. And ultimately, even outside of the love of the community, and I love the family of God. I wouldn't be here without the family of God, my sister girls and my brothers. I'm just telling you, the family of God is like, yes, okay? But the apex of the love that I receive that makes even all of that just seem so small is the love of God because He's the only one that sacrificed His life for me. He's the only one who has forgiven all of my crazy sins. He's the only one who's received me time and time again. He's the only one that said, girl, give me all your messed up decisions and your messes and watch me turn it around and give you a masterpiece for it. Like he's the only one who's done that. So his love supersedes it all. And all he's asking in return is if I love him back. I think everyone feels so challenged. You could only choose one option at once. Yes. So for example, like in raising children even, I, I'm naturally a very loving, yeah. giving, I don't, <laughs> yes. I'm not very good at the side of, you know, getting them in trouble or punishing them. And I don't, I never knew if it was good or not. I never knew if that was the right way. I know you're supposed to love your child, but you're also supposed to teach them and you know. Who do you dad? And I'm not so good, <laughs> I'm not so good at that either. Okay, well. <laughs> We're both good at having fun and giving a lot of love and living by example, thank God. But yeah. there is yeah. a part that we feel like sometimes is, missing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and I went out with my daughter the other day for her sweet 16. A year ago, we went to Tel Aviv and we got our nails done and we we're getting our nails done. And the lady said, you guys look like sisters. And I said, oh yeah, I look really young. Thank you so much. You know, she said, no, 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 I'm not talking about on the outside. It's because the way you interact, it's because it's because you can see she carries your values so much that you're so aligned in that. It doesn't seem like the mother and the daughter. Right. When you guys talk, you're you're talking as she's able to understand what you're saying, which are very oh, mature. And, yeah, and suddenly I realized, okay, that was my sign from God. In this situation, you've done it right. Yeah. It's a hard thing to discern. I love what you said of only you can know if that's your calling or not. Yeah. You know, I also, I, I, it's so funny. I feel like this is a, the best therapy session I've had. <laughs> <laughs> suddenly, like it's I'm also a place. public figure, public speaker, and and I hate public speaking. I'm terrified bit, yeah. of it. And it comes from a place of like, I don't believe they really want to hear from me. Why would they want to hear from me? Yes. And so a few weeks ago, I was asked to speak with the president of Israel and one of the the head of one of the biggest companies in Israel and uh, a lot of big VIPs that I was interested in hearing them yeah. speaking. And I was asked to speak and I was speaking to one of my mentors and I said, I don't, I don't think I'm going to do it. I said, why not? I said, because they're just asking me to speak because they want to honor me. I don't need the honor. They don't really want to hear me speak. Mm. I said, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm. Mm. that's not, that's not, that, that's your poor excuse for not showing up. Yes. They're inviting you because you, they want to hear you yeah. speak. And I had to really look in my heart of, okay, is this my thing or there, is this a calling? And, mm -hmm. and once I went with that perspective, I felt, how could I honor God? I was the only person who brought in Bible verses. I was the only person who put in the perspective of biblical values. Mm -hmm. And when I left, I felt like, okay, that was a calling that I would have Absolutely. backed out from if call. I didn't answer. Yeah. And then there are other times that really I'm not called there. Yeah. But no one else could answer that. I'm the yeah. only one that yeah. could answer that. Yeah, it's funny though. You're, I think it can change, don't you think it can change? Because yeah. in my first years, I was just I was a contemporary Christian artist, and that's what I loved. I just mm -hmm. loved. I had my band. I sang. I did mm -hmm. concerts. Talked to people at the end, and then went mm -hmm. back to the hotel. Yeah. And then I got this phone call from a friend of mine saying, um, "Are you doing anything on Saturday?" And I said, "No. Do you want to do something?" She said, "No. I need you to do something for me." And I'm like, "Yeah, sure." She said, will you go to Palm Springs and speak at a women's luncheon at a country club? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and she said, but I need you to. And I'll, I'm like, listen. And she was my best friend at yeah, the time, yeah. Marlene. I was like, Marlene, ask, you know, all the people who are speakers, ask one of them. And she said, I've asked them all. You are the bottom of the barrel. Oh, great. That was great. Great. Thank you. And so I said I would do it. And then on that morning, I'm like, oh, my gosh, why did I say I would do this? You're so called. And I was <laughs> terrified. Literally got up in front of a thousand women at this country club wow. in Palm Springs and just shot up one of those prayers, Lord, mm. what on earth do I do? And I literally felt the Holy Spirit say, just tell the truth. Mm -hmm. So I said, hello, <laughs> my name is Sheila. And eight weeks ago, I was released from a psychiatric hospital. Silence. <laughs> 
and I, I literally, that's what I did. I told my story. Yeah, I told them about hiding sure. for years, about being broken, about and oh, eventually collapsing, it. ending up, and this healing path I was oh, on. Amazing. And I couldn't even look at the women because I knew they were thinking, where did they get her? But they were not. Mm -hmm. Until toward the end, I actually made eye contact with some of them, and I saw tears flowing yep. through perfect yep. makeup. Yeah. And I remember th for the first time thinking, uh, oh my gosh, yeah. my brokenness is a far greater yeah. bridge to other Absolutely. people than my pretend wholeness Absolutely. ever was. Yes. And that was like, Absolutely. I mean, I remember driving home thinking, just saying to the Lord, you knew that was going to happen. Because on the drive there, I was apologizing. I was like, you are not going to look good today. But it was like, there's something about being open in different seasons of life to God slightly changing direction and you're like, well, I don't think I could do that. Yeah. Right. I'll just show up. You know, it's so interesting. I have discovered um, the presence and the strength of God in situations by doing them when I felt I had no strength at all. You know, I'll never forget the first time that I was asked to speak at a huge women's conference. And I listened to the two women who were on before me and they were brilliant. They were funny, they were articulate. You know, they studied the Bible, they knew all the Greek words and Hebrew words. And I, I remember locking myself in the bathroom at the break and I was on after the break thinking, oh Lord, I cannot do this. I have no, I mean, I don't have the words, I'm not funny, I don't have any, I can't do this. And I felt as if the Lord said something to me, and I've never heard the audible voice of God, but I felt this in my spirit as if the Lord said, Sheila, run in your own lane. You don't have to do what she's doing. You don't have to do what she's doing. Just run in your own lane. So I have to tell you, every time that I step on a platform or I sit down in front of you or we do better together or whatever it is, I do 100% understanding. I don't have what this takes, and Jesus does, and he will show up. And that just lets you breathe. He directs our steps yeah. through acceptance and rejection. Yeah. If we use yeah. the Bible as the key for that, yeah. Joseph, yeah. Paul, look at everybody, yeah. uh, uh, Esther. Mm -hmm. But we we can't let that the rejection or acceptance define us, right. even though it directs us. Right. It shouldn't yeah. define us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it's we shouldn't take on this pride of look, I've got these open doors, yeah. you know. And I would just say to you, especially you know. Standing in the position you're in, you know, really representing a country and yeah. in multiple countries is what I have learned as being a female in kind of a male dominated uh, profession or ministry mm -hmm. is that I would say, what are these men like 50 year old men? They don't want to hear from me. Like right. what, you know, and I would say that. And then God would send multiple 50 year old men up to me to say what you said yeah. just yeah. healed my heart. Yeah. I had a mother that abused me or I had a daughter that I just saw the potential, you know, and when you were talking and I think for you is, is just and all of us as women to recognize that we can think, why would anybody want to, we don't have to know because we don't know what happens behind the scenes yeah. with them when their heart is open to be able to hear a woman of God stand up and speak peace and direction and, right. and pu with purity and love. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, it's a need that I did not even know right. needed to be met. Right. Wow. Um, so I think just knowing what that we are called and what that sounds like when God calls our name, yeah. it means calling us out of our old nature and out of our fear into something new. Yeah, yeah and normally I, I think being uncomfortable with something, you know, God wants to use you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. He He wants to use every person. There's enough to do on the planet that He everybody could be All hands on fully deck. used yeah. of God yeah. 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 to go help and minister to somebody, whether it's to go tell that lady over there how cute she looks today, yeah. Yeah. To, to go give someone a hug, to pass your little coupon back to the person behind yeah. you, yes. whatever. God wants to use us to heal each other, yeah. you know, and to minister to each other. So it's a lot of times it is that thought that crosses your mind that, oh, I wonder if I should go do. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes, I should probably go do that. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and it's an action. dropping yes. any pride, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and maybe doing it privately or yeah. Yeah. nonchalantly, mm -hmm. you know, I felt the Lord gave someone a word in the church and my, I'm sitting over there and I'm thinking, this little lady, it sounded like she was trying to feed her family. Mm -hmm. I just thought, man, on my way out, I'd like to just find her Bible mm -hmm. and just on my way, just 
yeah. give her and just leave. Yeah. That God is looking out for you. Yeah, absolutely. God is, and I and I missed my moment because actually I forgot about it for a minute. But that little kind of stuff, God yeah, wants to use us yeah. every yeah. single day. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah. you even remembering what you should have done is going to spark in other people to remember what they should have mm -hmm. done to go back and do that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll never forget a story that my mom told as a little girl. And she said, um, her and I were walking into the grocery store, and I actually remember this. And there was this gentleman standing by the door on the outside. And when we walked in, my mom just stopped and she reached into her purse and she got out a quarter and she hurried back outside and that little man was gone and she looked all over for him and i remember the feeling that my mom felt i remember watching my mom go i should have done this when i felt the lord speak to me when i felt prompted to give and i know that stuff like that bothers me even but it bothered my mom those little those little times where you don't have to hear a big booming voice say to give or to share or to listen or to just when you when you feel it listen to the god on the inside of you and and take take ear take give do 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 what you feel in your heart to do something giving uh, out of love to someone. Because if you don't, I think we'll always regret those little moments of time. The lady yeah. that was after you probably put on that she was just fine until oh, she came yeah. after you, and then it's like, well, okay, what's yeah. up? Yeah, what's wrong? Mm -hmm. And then she breaks. Yeah, God, God would do that to people all over the world if yeah. we, as His children yeah. stepped up and just absolutely do what we're created to do and needed to do that's this yeah. whole point is that we are needed yeah. yeah we are all needed in the kingdom and in the body of christ yeah. Yeah. every single day that we wake up god is saying you still have not fulfilled your purpose yeah. Yeah. there's still more work for you here to yeah. do I remember when at the fellowship, we were trying to assess the best way to distribute aid. We give around $80 million of food aid a year wow. to uh, people in Israel and the former Soviet yeah. Union. So we want to do it the most effectively, the most efficiently. We create criteria on who's the most in need and who doesn't have family support and who's the poorest and do it in every single place, how, how to use volunteers. And, and we work very hard in order to make sure every penny goes directly to the people in the most efficient ways. Yeah. And there was someone in the office who came and said, we should close down the soup kitchens. They're not, they're not what we want to do is give dignity. Soup kitchens aren't dignified. Mm. We want to give the food cards. We want to give the food boxes, let them choose what they want to put in the box and deliver it to their house. Soup kitchens are not dignified. We shouldn't be supporting it. And I heard it and I said, I'm going to go and actually uh, ask the people there what they think because I'm not here <laughs> for my own glory. I'm here to help. Yeah. And I want to ask the people there, would they rather us bring them a food box? Would they rather have a card that they could go shopping? And I remember I went and it reminded me of when you, you were telling the story of your son and bringing him to minister and how it changed mm -hmm. his life forever that now he's studying to be a, a psychologist. Um, I remember I went to the soup kitchen and I saw people in Israel, from Russia, sitting together and speaking Russian, yes. and Unity. Ethiopians Unity. sitting together Unity and table. speaking Amharic, Unity. and young mm. mothers who didn't look like they needed any help sitting together yes. and talking about their children and, and taking their Tupperware that they could bring their children back That's food great. for dinner. Mm -hmm. And I went just to have fellowship with them. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I asked at, at each table, I said, you know, how is it here? How's the food? How's this? Oh, this is this is the best. And at, at every table, there were at, at least five people who said, this is why I wake up in the morning. Wow. Wow. I have nowhere, uh, specifically the elderly, I have nowhere else oh. to go. I have nowhere else where they speak yes. Russian, where they speak Amharic. Wow. I have nowhere else where they speak French and that they're in a similar predicament to me. Yeah. They said, I, this soup kitchen is the reason why I get out of bed every morning. Wow. Wow. And I remember I went back to the office and I said, we're funding more soup kitchens. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Good for you. Yeah. You know, I think it's so, so important also that when we see beautiful, amazing people, Sheila and I are witnesses to what you do in Israel and other countries. We can support that. We can support each other in everything that we do. God wants to use us all. But 
but Yael can go places, she can do things that I can't do. Yeah. I can't get yeah. all over like she can. She's got it going, you know. Yeah. So supporting her yeah. vision is super important. Yeah. Um, but I think that as we go out and do the things that feel uncomfortable, be the people that God wants us to be and serve each other like we would be serving the Lord is, is our call and our destiny. You know, when I think about the Lord's Prayer, He says, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is a now prayer. That is a Your kingdom come. Well, how's His kingdom going to come? It's going to come through us. It's going to come because of us. We are His will in action here on earth. And I think that's important to God because that includes eternity bringing God's kingdom right down here to earth. That's where it matters. That's where it counts. We are doing things now that affect eternity. I think that all of us have a lot of life missions and purposes, and it could change many times even throughout the day. When I'm at home, my life mission and purpose is having a healthy marriage, being a good mother, and being focused on giving my family exactly what they need in that moment. And when I step out of the house, my focus is on doing what God calls me to do in that moment in order to bring glory to Him. And so sometimes it's sitting with the Prime Minister of Israel. Sometimes it's giving speeches to government officials and business leaders. Sometimes it's speaking in churches or spreading our mission in synagogues. And other times it's sitting next to an elderly who doesn't have food, holding her hand and listening to her cry. And so wherever I go, I feel like it's not by chance. I realize that God has put me here for such a time as this, not just in the macro sense, but in the micro sense here, right now, in this moment, for such a time as this. And we don't need a permission slip. We already have that. We have that in the Word of God, a permission slip to serve. And I think, like you said, if we just listen, like you responded to that lady, just pay attention to people's heart. What's, what's their heart saying? Yeah. Not just what their mouth is saying. but And if we just listen to God and obey yeah. and respond, then we can serve in every situation we're in. We don't need a job title. Yeah. We don't need a permission slip. We don't need an invitation. Yeah. We've already been the Great Commission yes. is to go give good news. You know, I think sometimes we're serving also just by sitting at the table, yes. yeah. being with each other, like you're saying. Yeah. Just what do you need to discuss? What do you need? What yes. can I help you with? What? How can yeah. I encourage you? Me sitting at the table may be the service God has for me. Uh, yeah, I know some of the most meaningful times that I felt I was doing God's work. You know, within you have the job title and traveling around the world, but is. When I see somebody in my community who was at the grocery store and I saw she was looking really sad and I said, hey, why don't you come over and let's have a cup of exactly. tea? Yeah. And I saw her face light up exactly. and she came over and that was the best kindness I could do. That's the best ministry. That's the best um, calling that I could fulfill in that moment. Absolutely. Right. Well, and just to listen, at least I've, I've grown to really value the older I've gotten the power and anointing on you to listen yeah. mm -hmm. is to really he hear what isn't being said, mm -hmm. but to just open your heart to people and let them share yeah. what they're going through. Mm -hmm. They'll tell you. Mm -hmm. yeah. They will tell you. In fact, so many times in the altar when someone comes for a prayer, they just they don't even know what to ask for. It's just they're going to unload. This is what's going on yeah. in my life. And they end up answering the question they're asking Absolutely. by just feeling like someone loves me. Mm -hmm. And in an environment, like you said, safe sisters. Mm -hmm. When you have an environment where you can just open your heart and someone will listen to you. Yeah. We live in a generation where to express is celebrated. We all have a platform, we all have social media, we're always telling our thoughts, sharing the news articles, sharing what we believe. And I believe that that's a huge step in um, expressing our feelings and sharing with others. But we need to balance that with the ability to listen. And sometimes we forget how to listen 
Sometimes we don't want to listen because it's too scary. Maybe we're going to disagree and then what do we do? Or if we listen, then it puts responsibility on us that we're so consumed within our own thoughts so we don't have the space to listen. That I think the work that we really, really need to do, especially now in this world where there's so much conflict, conflict in politics, conflict in families, conflict in communities, if we stopped for a minute just to listen and didn't feel threatened by it, didn't feel scared by listening, but that we wanted to listen, that we asked someone that maybe we don't love so much. We asked them questions about their life and expressed interest and listened. Very often, that will ignite the love. A lot of times someone who's angry is holding a lot of pain. Somebody who's mean has experienced a lot of abuse. And when we only see the mean, when we only see the anger, it's easy to hate. When we hear their story, it suddenly makes it easier to love. So I believe that we can all agree that we're called to love. And how would we get there? By one word, listening. I'm so moved by that story in Mark's gospel where the woman who has the issue of blood comes and just touches the edge of yeah. Christ's garment. And I didn't know that it was when we were in Israel um, that one of the girls that we were with talked about the fact that that fringe, the edge of the garment, the word used for there is the same as the word used in the Older Testament, he will rise with healing in his wings. Yeah. It's the same word. Yeah. So to reach out and touch that tassel was like, if, if this is Messiah, mm -hmm. there will be healing in his yeah. wings. Yeah. And what I love about it is, she, you know, Christ, the minute she touches him, she's healed. But then Jesus asks, you know, who touched me? <laughs> who touched story. me? And favorites. she could have gone home, you know, because she was healed. She could have shown up seven days later with, a, you know, an offering and mm -hmm. she could have gone on. But Jesus wanted to make her whole. He wanted yes. more than she wanted for herself. Yes. And when she falls at his feet and she tells him everything. Yeah. And he listened. And I think that you're right. People are lonely in our world, yeah. you know? And I think that, you know, just the th sitting down with someone and saying, hey, what's going on? And then actually really listening. Because yes. sometimes we're afraid to do that because we think, well, what if I don't have the answer? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking sometimes people are not so much looking for answers. No. They're looking for someone who will sit with them. You yes. Know? Yes. And that in itself is a gift. It, yeah. There's pivotal moments in my life where I thought I ended up waiting on my tires to be replaced or something, and it was like a nuisance. Yeah. And I end up entering a conversation with someone there that is actually helps me develop a message right. for yeah. thousands of people. Yeah. When I thought, I'm here waiting on my car, it's inconvenient, and I'd rather be working on this message, that's pressuring me. And and then I enter and it's like, you know what, I'm here, I'm not gonna waste my time, how are you? Yeah. And and God brings me the answer I need yeah. by serving. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's like, oh my gosh, God, you really are about ordering our steps. If we would just lean into nothing is an accident, yeah and uh, trusting God in that process of relationship. And you said, you know, sometimes you're not looking for an answer. Yeah. I think you're right. I think sometimes it's just I'm able to be vulnerable enough with you mm -hmm. and tell you that, hey, it may not be a good time. We can't afford a safari or whatever it might yeah. be. And you not discrediting me or saying, now you're disqualified from being a part of us, but you're saying, hey, no, there's still a place for you. Mm -hmm. Like, we still love you, we have you, we're together. Like that in itself is an answer, you know, that really feeds the soul and the heart because it says I belong. And even with the thing of you talking about the woman with the issue, one of the things I love that Jesus said to her in front of everybody who would have been whispering about her, who would have been suspicious of her ailment. You know, he said, daughter, your faith has made you whole. So someone who was not a part or who didn't feel like she was a part of the family, mm -hmm. Jesus was saying in front of everybody, you belong. Yeah. You know, my father is your father. Daughter, your faith has made you whole. You know what? We're so much like each other than you ever thought. <laughs> sometimes we're behind a mic, sometimes we're be on a stage, sometimes you're behind a camera. Most of the time, I'm at home. Most of the time at home, I'm at home working, I'm with my kids, I'm with my husband. We're on the phone, I'm listening to Matt on the phone. Not sure what we're going to do that day, but we're all busy, we're all taking calls, whatever. Do you know what the most important thing is? Is that when I leave my house, when I walk out my door, 
There might not be a camera, there might not be a microphone, but it's those little things that come my way every day. It's those little things that come your way every day. That smile that you give, that helping hand, that buying someone a coffee, those little things, anything that you can do to show the love of Christ. God wants to use you in ways that you never dreamed possible. And it's just stepping outside your door. Maybe it's not going out your door. Maybe it's staying inside ministering to those around you. God wants to use you today. I believe that sometimes the what they're not saying is what the Holy Spirit is actually saying to us. Mm. Like what she didn't say in church. She didn't say she had this need, but you heard it. And I don't think it was just you telling you. I believe in those moments, it's the Spirit of God telling us something that they can't utter. Yes. They do, she does need this, you know, or go and be there for them or pray over them or just sit and listen and give them a hug later, you know, whatever it is. But I believe in those moments, since we're, I don't think we're just smart enough to be so intuitive to know everything. Yeah. But I believe in those moments, the Holy Spirit works through our, whether it's our intuition or our, our whatever, yeah. to allow us to know. No, I, be I believe that's done. distinctly at a level feminine. Yeah. Because when Jesus spoke and he called three women at three different times a woman, one of them was his mother, mm -hmm. and it could have appeared disrespectful. But when he said woman, he was looping all the way back to Eve yes. and the curse that was connected to her. Well, go ahead. But her word, it. her it, when God said, yeah. This is you're a woman. Your mother of the future. Mm -hmm. When Jesus called his mother that, she said, you know, we have a need here. We've run out of wine. Mm -hmm. I need you to do this. And I know what you can do. Mm -hmm. I've seen what you can do. We don't know the background of stories, yeah. how she knew, yeah. but she knew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, woman. Or it could have been. What? Woman. Yeah. Woman. He said right back to her, it, it's not my time yet. Mm -hmm. And yet she called something into existence that wasn't even supposed to be on the calendar yes. yet mm -hmm. and said, no, do what he says. Yes. And I feel like as women, we have a womb, a spiritual womb mm -hmm. where we can see kind of like a sonogram, what's what's going on underneath. And mm -hmm. a really, it's a spiritual gift. I agree. Amen. And it's yes. discernment. Yes. It's wisdom. That's why wisdom is always called a woman. woman. And I, I feel eight. that's what's so beautiful <laughs> about Better Together yes. is that men have their gift and their anointing. And we can, we can strive and we can try to be a, a man. And we totally miss. Yeah the extra element that God has given us absolutely, from chromosome all the way up absolutely. into complement. being able to see what isn't available yet, yeah. to see what's coming. It needs to yeah. be born. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's that's so good. beautiful about women relationships. I think that's why the enemy fights female relationships Yeah, it's yeah. because we can look into one another's heart yeah. and say, you know what? You're really gifted at this. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you have something really special yeah. on you. And um, I think it's it's just an honor to be able to do that with you all. And I'm hoping and praying that people watching online too and doing our conversation have learned something about what God's called them to do. Amen. Amen. Um, shall we pray on that note? Avinu Sheba Shamayim, our Father in heaven, we come to you together for that element of togetherness, of oneness, where we each know how we are called to serve whether it's in the big world, whether it's in our homes, whether it's in our communities, we pray, Lord, that you'll give us the eyes to see how we can make this world better, how we can work with you in partnership and bringing more unity, more godliness, more holiness, more togetherness, because we know we're better together. Lord, let us put aside our own ego and make space to hear your word in our serving to do your will. Bless our homes, our families, our nations, our intentions, our thoughts, our actions. And let us come to know you in your purest form in every detail of our lives. Let us always strive to do more, to reach out, to be better, to improve. And just like the Esters of the world, step up knowing that we're needed, let us step up in every area of our life. Let us bring you joy, let you give us wisdom, and partnering with you, Lord, let us see a better world now of shalom, of peace, 
of godliness, of holiness, and of only good things. We pray this in your name. Amen. 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 My prayer for the next generation is the priestly prayer that we've been praying over our children since Jacob prayed it over his children. May God watch over you and protect you and bring you peace. I think the message of that priestly prayer is that God has his eyes on you. God is blessing you. The blessing of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the blessing of everyone who was, who set the path for where we are today, is still blessing our lives today. And so my blessing for the next generation is that they'll open up their hearts to the enormous wellspring of blessing and light and goodness and peace that God wants to rain down on them, to open up their hearts and accept it.